thanks a lot to Bert and Ricardo for organizing this very nice uh, uh, workshop. And uh, Juan, let's uh, I'll, I'll I'll hand when I when I need to change slides. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for helping with that. Um, so this is a joint work with um, uh, Carlo Ciliberto at Imperial College, Alessandro Rudi at INRIA, and Leonard Vosnick at UCL. And um, it, uh, it tries to put a new perspective, mainly coming from, uh, uh, from statistics and statistical learning to, to quantum machine learning and specifically supervised problem in quantum machine learning. So uh, let me begin with a, with a very brief history of supervised quantum machine learning. Uh, so we could say that it all began with actually one of Aram's work in 2008 that uh, introduced a, a faster, uh, actually an exponentially faster uh, quantum algorithm for doing linear algebra. And this uh, opened up the, the possibility of, um, of, of speeding up essentially every main uh, supervised machine learning algorithm. And, uh, and the trick was actually quite simple. All these algorithms at some point have an optimization problem that can be cast uh, as a matrix inversion problem. So let's just uh, apply HHL to this matrix inversion problem and we can go from an algorithm that is polynomial in N to one that is polylogarithmic in N. Okay, that was around from 2008 uh, till 2015 and around. And in 2015, well, uh, among many, but I think that was one of the most consequential uh, papers. Actually, started as a blog post and then was published in, in, in Nature Physics. Scott Aronson wrote this nice piece saying, oh, wait, wait a minute, there are many, many caveats with this uh, uh, quantum machine learning algorithms powered by linear algebra. Uh, we should be more careful. And, and one of the main caveats was one that was discussed many times today in both Vedran's talk and Aaron's talk, and it was about uh, um, uh, the how to load data efficiently in, uh, in in a quantum system. Can we do that? Well, there's this proposal of the QRAM, but uh, we're not quite sure whether we can build that, and uh, and that's opened up many doubts. And uh, the community kept going, and we arrived at uh, two years ago when when the brilliant Ewing Tangs um, uh, asked herself the question. Oh, wait a minute, but what uh, if we have a classical computer that is equipped with the same uh, uh, sampling ability on the data set that a quantum computer has? Can we, can we do the same tricks and get um, um, polylogarithmic uh, classical algorithms? And the answer turned out to be yes, um, under the caveat that, uh, well, you need a, a very um, powerful classical data structure and caveat B that your data set must be low rank. But if you do two caveats hold, well, then you can uh, dequantize or, or, or get polylogarithmic classical algorithms with for all these problems. And what, what's the present um, um, uh, state of the supervised quantum machine learning? Of course, we have all the um, NISC era ideas that are, that, are, that are still being developed, but in terms of the more provable kind of, um, uh, of, uh, of research, the two questions are, well, we can still get polynomial speed ups. So how good are those polynomial speed ups? And, uh, and the second question, well, but if we na natively have quantum data, perhaps we can get something uh, still good out of this algorithm. And, uh, and, and my talk will, in a way, will try to address both those two present questions from the angle of, uh, of, uh, of statistical learning theory. But um, uh, let me give you a, a brief introduction to what I mean by statistical learning theory. Uh, apologies for, for those of you who already know about uh, this, this quite basic material. Um, so in, in the setting that, that I'm using, we have a probability distribution row over, over two sets, X and Y. X is, the, is your input set and Y is your output set. And then we have a training set composed by N IID points sampled from row. And, and this training set is fed to, uh, to a learning algorithm uh, that takes S of N and returns an hypothesis F and that is supposed to describe uh, uh, what's going on in the training set and hopefully to generalize outside of, uh, of the training set. Well, how, how do we judge how good is the hypothesis that our algorithm returns? Well, we need a loss function that is essentially a way to measure how good we are doing. Um, and, um, and the, the whole goal of supervised learning is, is really um, making the quantity that you, the, the, 
that you see at the bottom of the slide, um, that is the expected risk is to make this quantity small. The expected risk is just the expected value computed over the distribution row of uh, your loss function computed on the true points y and the one that we compute with, with, with f. Now, um, this quantity is not really computable because we don't have access to rho, but only to, um, to, to samples from rho. Uh, one, if you can change the, the, the slide. Yes, thank you. And uh, so there's the question of how do we choose an hypothesis from finite samples? And, and the prescription we're going to use is, uh, um, that is, I mean, there are many prescriptions. The most commonly used is empirical risk minimization that, that says, well, just choose an hypothesis that minimizes the empirical risk. That is the same risk that you saw in the previous slide, but computed uh, on, um, on, on your training set. And, uh, and well, and also let's uh, just clarify that your algorithm can, can pick this, uh, this hypothesis F from a space of hypothesis, that is where your algorithm looks for, for the best candidate. And we will use this as a kind of very weak assumption that there exists a minimizer uh, of the empirical risk in the, in the hypothesis space. Uh, yes, one, if you can change slide, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry, can I just interrupt? So what do yes. you mean by, why is this an assumption? I'm, I'm missing something. Well, you might not have uh, an infimum of that, uh, of that object. If your hypothesis class is infinitely big, you might not have- Right, but I mean, any, to... any, any application where I'm working with, let's say, numerical precision descriptions of things. Yes, yes, of course you do. But this is just uh, kind of in the, yeah, thank you for that. And um, um, so the key result that we will use in this talk, and perhaps the key result in statistical learning theory, is that magically we can control the errors. And so what do I mean by that? Um, so in the supremium that you see in the, in, the, in the main equation of the slide, you see a difference between the empirical risk, so the risk that you make, that you compute on your samples, minus uh, the, the true risk, the one that you compute over the entire distribution. Now, under uh, some mild assumptions, you can show you can, that the error that you make by estimating the true risk uh, with the empirical risk uh, can be controlled. Can be controlled by what? In the, in the square root, you have three quantities. One uh, is, um, well, it's, it's a parameter delta that is essentially just modeling uh, uh, the fact that you might be very unlucky with uh, with your training set and that might be unrepresentative of the underlying distribution. Then you have a parameter c of h that is a measure of complexity of your function class like vc dimension covering numbers or rather macro complexities and on a denominator you have n the number of elements in your training set. So you can see that the error essentially scales as one over square root of n and I will make frequent use of this statement. The error scales as one of a square root of n. And that's what I mean by, by, by this statement. Uh, one, if you could change slide, please. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the errors that come up uh, are of very different flavors. The one that we have seen, it's a purely statistical error. It's essentially telling you, you, have, you don't have enough information about the, the distribution and you estimate with a finite number of samples. So this is a type of error that is statistical and or, or generalization error, but there are other kinds of errors. So another kind of error is the one that is coming from the fact that the optimization problem for estimating the minimum or the, of the infimum of the, of the empirical risk might not converge to the exact uh, minimum. And, and we're just approximating that. So through the uh, error decomposition that you see in the equation, you can see that um, the, the risk of our, um, the true risk of our uh, estimator is, can be decomposed in two parts. One is the, just the, the statistical error that scales as one over square root of n. And the other one, it's, it's a purely algorithmic error. Now, in order to achieve the best possible statistical accuracy, that is the one that goes as one over square root of n, we must uh, be very careful that the algorithmic error that we introduce is not bigger. Because if that is bigger, it, it's going to dominate the statistical error 
And so we are, we are essentially wasting uh, resources because uh, the, all the information that we have uh, is uh, obfuscated by the fact that we are adding extra errors from the optimization process. So in the equation in red that you see at the bottom of the slide, you see that we, we must make sure that the algorithmic error is at most uh, one over square root of n. And, um, but let me put more concreteness into these ideas um, and let me give you a working example so that I will use to, um, uh, to, to, to detail all the, the ideas of this paper. So the working example is least squares. So it's an algorithm for minimizing the empirical risk that you see in the first equation. And, um, and uh, in this case, uh, the hypothesis class that you use is the class of linear functions and, your, your, and, and the loss function that you use is the squared loss. Now, um, it's very easy. It's very easy computation to take the gradient of this object, uh, use a bit of renaming, this capital X and B, and you can see that you can write in a closed form solution for the least square problems. Uh, and that is uh, uh, W that is equivalent to capital X minus one times B. And uh, so in order to solve least squares, the only thing that you need to do, it's a matrix inversion and, and a multiplication. So you see that the computational cost is dominated by matrix inversion. And that's why uh, the HHL algorithm was, uh, was um, was so nice in this context because, well, pretty much all you need to do is, uh, is use HHL to invert that matrix and you can get a pretty substantial speed up. And, um, but let's now move to, to the quantum domain. So in, in the quantum domain, the fastest quantum algorithm for least squares um, has a time complexity that you can see in the first big equation down just under the first line. So the time complexity of this algorithm is polylogarithmic in n, in k, that is the condition number, and also in the inverse uh, of the uh, error or the approximation parameter of the algorithm. However, it's also uh, has also a linear dependency in the Frobenius norm uh, of, uh, of x. So you only get a, a speed up when x is, uh, is low rank. And um, there, are, there have been the, 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 um, some algorithms that um, don't have a, a dependency on the Frobenius norm have been developed. However, these algorithms have a worse uh, uh, error scaling. And that is uh, what you see in the third bullet point. Uh, and you can see that the, in that case, the, the error does, uh, the scales as uh, a gamma to the minus three and is no longer polylogarithmic. Um, what is the output of these uh, of both these algorithms? Uh, well, this out the output is not really a quantum encoding uh, of uh, of uh, of the parameter w, but is a quantum state tilde w, such that uh, it's close in some uh, in some norm to to the true to, to the true label, and that is and that's what I mean when I say that is uh, well we're just approximating and not getting the exact the exact value. Um, now let's um, um, let's uh, move to, to study what's the algorithmic error of quantum least squares. <clears throat> so in the in two slides ago, I, I, I said that one key quantity is the algorithmic error, and we must uh, be sure that the alg that the algorithmic error isn't bigger of the generalization error. So that kind of error is not dominating the statistic, the, the generalization error. So let's uh, directly compute what's the algorithmic error in the case uh, of quantum least squares. Well, it's, it's just a very few simple, very few lines of, uh, of, uh, of algebra. And the only two assumptions that we need to make are that to assume that X and Y are bounded. And, uh, and then we just, it's just a repetition of Cauchy's Schwartz, uh, and uh, and we can uh, bound the algorithmic error in terms uh, of the cons of a constant k, and uh, of uh, the parameter gamma that we saw in the previous slide. So now let's um, um, let's move on the next slide, and uh, and do the following thing. Let's try to match the bounds uh, for for quantum least squares. Um, Let's first consider the, um, the, the full rank case. So this is the case where the dependency is not, uh, is still a, a poly inverse polynomial in the error. So we know in that uh, 
um, uh, that the best statistical accuracy is attained when the algorithmic error case is one over square root of n. Well, because of the result that we have obtained in the previous slide, to match the bound, we must set the parameter gamma uh, to be uh, one over square root of n. Therefore, by plugging in gamma in, uh, in, um, in the overall runtime uh, of the algorithm, we can see that for the algorithm that works also in the full rank case, the, uh, the overall runtime becomes polynomial when we take into account uh, the, the matching of the bounds. Okay, well, uh, well this is all, all very nice and interesting. However, we know that there exist uh, algorithms that have a better scaling uh, in, in the error. And, and, and the sort of arguments that I've outlined here wouldn't apply to, to alg quantum algorithms that have a polylogarithmic dependency in the error. So in order to tackle um, this case, um, we, we should just digress for a bit and consider uh, measurement errors in quantum algorithms. So when we run a quantum algorithm, uh, in order to, to get classical information out, uh, we, we must, uh, we must uh, do uh, some measurements. And, um, and, uh, and uh, ultimately our estimate, classical estimate reduces to a sequence of estimation of, of expected values of quantum operators. Now this, uh, this estimation in the most naive setting, um, the error that we make in this estimation um, um, scales as one over square root of M, where M is the number of measurements that we make in the algorithm. And this is, uh, uh, this is known as the shot noise limit. However, using techniques uh, uh, coming from quantum metrology, uh, one can, estimate, can estimate expected values with a precision that scales as one over M. And, and, and it is possible to prove uh, that this is the uh, ultimate measurement precisions and directly follows from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So how do we plug in uh, uh, measurements, uh, errors in our analysis uh, of, um, um, of the supervised quantum learning algorithms? Well, let Y be the ideal prediction of the algorithm and Y star be uh, the actual classical outcome of the quantum algorithm. Um, again, using uh, just a, a simple application of Cauchy's parts and, uh, and of the bounds that we discussed uh, uh, previously, uh, we can see that uh, the, the two errors, the one coming from the measure when measurements uh, and the uh, algorithmic error adds up additively. So we must be very careful again to make sure that the errors coming from the measurements uh, does not overcome uh, the algorithmic error and in turn the, the error coming from, uh, um, from the generalization error. And so in order to do that, what we need to do is uh, again, make sure that the number of samples uh, that we use to estimate uh, our expected values uh, must, uh, uh, must give us an error that match uh, the algorithmic error. So in this way, what we are essentially having is that the time complexity of least squares uh, is, uh, is lower bounded by square root of n. And in, in this sense, we're uh, effectively killing the possibility of, of an exponential speed up. Let me zoom out um, and give you a, like a general uh, statement of our results, a full generality. So in a nutshell, what we're arguing is that um, if you consider um, the, the statistical property of the estimators. And so uh, the best error you can achieve with a given number of samples, supervised quantum machine learning algorithms cannot achieve polylogarithmic runtimes in N. Okay, so there are three very important things to note in, in this results. Number one is that uh, our results apply even in cases where we naturally have uh, quantum access to the data. So coming back to uh, the little history of quantum machine learning among the open questions there was, oh, but if we have uh, naturally available quantum data, perhaps all these techniques are still very interesting and powerful. Well, uh, this is, our results should sound as, as some sort of a, of, a, of a warning signal and saying, well, if you want to get the classical information out, uh, well, not quite. You still cannot get an exponential speed up. Uh, second thing to note is that we do not rule out exponential advantages over classical algorithms um, 
that uh, have a super polynomial runtime. And, uh, and this, this connects to the first talk uh, of, uh, of this uh, sec session by, by, by Vedran that was exactly pointing out at this issue that we should focus on problem where the classical case is, is already computationally hard. And, um, and third issue is that uh, our results do not make any assumption on the hypothesis space. And um, so if you have prior knowledge uh, on, uh, on your data set, uh, uh, you can get error rates that converge faster than one over square root of n. Just to get a bit of a, what, what do I mean by that? Consider the extreme case um, where you know exactly what function uh, uh, is, or the probability distribution that is describing your data set. Well, you can just output that with, with zero error. And that's the extreme case uh, of uh, you have maximum information. Now there is uh, a whole, um, a continuum of possibilities between that extreme case uh, and the case where you have no information, but uh, our results do not make assumption on the hypothesis space. So in principle, it's possible to get bounds that converge faster than one over square root of n. Um, now, let me give you a, a bit of a comparison table of, um, of some important classical and quantum algorithms. And uh, on the classical side, I've put uh, uh, super vector machines uh, and, and their training time, that is uh, n cubed. And then I've put the state of the art for the type of uh, uh, kernel learning that uh, super vector machines are doing. So Falcon is an algorithm that using random features, um, uh, so basically randomized linear algebra techniques uh, of a very similar kind uh, of the ones Ewing Tank used. One can go from n cubed to n square root of n. And in the quantum case, instead of, of put uh, the quantum SVM algorithm and the quantum uh, uh, kernel least square algorithms and their respective training times. And, um, and um, under the assumption that uh, we need to match uh, uh, the, all the errors as, uh, as we have done in, uh, in, in the talk. And uh, you can see from the, the two um, train times that I highlighted in red that essentially the best, uh, uh, the best algorithms, uh, best classical and quantum algorithms have fairly similar run times if we consider all these caveats. And uh, still the quantum algorithm is, uh, is better. However, this algorithm wouldn't work for full rank data. Um, um, well, actually even Falcon wouldn't work for full rank data. And, um, but, um, well, we, we're getting close and the, and the polynomial uh, difference between the two scalings is not, uh, it starts to, to be um, not, uh, not extremely significant. So um, a, a, a small uh, section for frequently asked questions that I, I get when, when talking about uh, this work. And the first one is, well, but you know, statistical learning theory cannot really explain uh, neural networks. And that, that is essentially hinting at something that Lenka discussed, uh, discussed on Monday. And, and I do agree that current tools to analyze neural networks uh, uh, fail to, uh, to, um, um, to, to account for why, for why they work. And by current tools, I mean current statistical learning theory uh, work. Um, however, this seems much more a problem of the fact that we don't have good ways to encode uh, mathematically, to describe mathematically the sort of prior information that neural networks encode about the, the problems that they tackle. Um, but uh, what I would like to stress is that the bounds uh, that uh, were presented in this talk and the, the fundamental theory theorem of statistical learning do remain true. And I mean, it wouldn't be theorem other, otherwise. And um, coming to the second uh, question that I often get asked is, is uh, how general is your result? Well, I would uh, argue that it's fairly general, but let me stress again that we only cover supervised uh, learning and we only rule out exponential advantages over efficient classical algorithms. If your algorithm is not efficient, by which I mean that has a super polynomial runtime, our algorithms no longer apply. And, um, and, uh, and, and again, coming into the point that I was making in the previous slide, slide if you have a lot of prior information, well, you could get better bounds. 
Uh, however, I would warn that you need a lot of prior information because what you need is to have exponentially better statistical rates uh, before this kind of arguments uh, no longer works. And now to, um, uh, to, to conclude, um, so I, I, I began my talk with this brief history of supervised quantum machine learning and, and, and uh, can the present in this specific domain of kind of provable ideas, uh, there was the question of, well, can we get uh, um, uh, good polynomial speed ups uh, because the algorithms that Ewen Tang introduced had this, uh, this horrible um, uh, the n to the power of 16 or, or I don't even remember run times. So perhaps we can still get very significant polynomial speed ups. And the other question is, oh, but, but, but we, we can um, analyze quantum data very efficiently. Um, well, the I guess the two take home uh, messages are that there exist barriers to exponential speed ups uh, to efficient classical algorithms that come from statistical arguments. And, uh, and these arguments apply even if your data is naturally quantum. However, you want to get out uh, uh, classical information. But I would argue that at some point you always want, uh, uh, you want, you always want that. I think that uh, it's also very important to highlight that still polynomial speed up can, can, can be crucial. However, these polynomial speed ups, as we saw in the, in the previous, uh, in the two slides ago in the comparison, can be smaller than you expect. No longer like 15 powers of n, but perhaps just a, it's a it's linear difference. And, uh, and as an outlook, I, I would, uh, I would uh, just uh, again, be in, in line of what Veteran said to, to, to one talk ago, two talks ago, that we, we should put more resources in, 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 try, in trying to understand whether there are interesting computationally hard learning problems. And I think this is an area that has been uh, uh, not very much explored unless in the, in the, in the small subfield of probably approximately correct learning that uh, well, often these sort of algorithms are not terribly interesting. And, and with that, I apologize again for the, for the, for the tech glitches at the beginning. And, and I think, thank you very much for, for, for your time. Thank you, Andre. And, uh, are there any questions? I guess right now I can see the chat, but uh, let me see if I can. I think yeah, that's so, yeah, Right, there are questions. So can you, uh, Bert, can you go ahead and ask the question? Yeah. So. Uh, to me, obvious candidate for computationally hard learning problem is the uh, is the Boltzmann machine, right? It's just any Bayesian inference problem is computationally hard. So, does that fall in your? Is that feature? well? The thing is that uh, these kind of problems uh, are too hard. So a lot of uh, inference and graphical models problems tend to be NP hard. So. Um, Perhaps I should have clarified in my last point that one should have that kind of kind of sweet uh, sweet spot of hardness uh, that uh, well it's often in this uh, a strange class of NP intermediate problems uh, like uh, uh, like factoring all the hidden subgroup problems uh, that are uh, hard for classical computers but not so hard that not even a quantum computer can tackle them. Um, so definitely like some smooth variations of, uh, um, of problems on, 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 on Bayesian networks uh, and then of graphical inference can be, uh, can, be, um, can be potentially candidates, but uh, um, I don't know of any specific instance of these problems uh, that has the right kind of hardness. And, uh, but I mean, if you, I'm confused because if you have a graphical model and you run, uh, I mean, then basically the sparsity sort of uh, uh, sets the complexity of the inference task there. And so if you, because you can run the junction tree and basically the, the, the width of, the, of the, the, the largest clique in that graph is setting the, the complexity. So you can basically go from one extreme that you have a fully connected graph, which is extremely hard to, uh, to a linear array, uh, one dimensional thing where, where the complexity is order n. So you can get anywhere from, from polynomial, linear actually, to exponential. So somewhere in there, there should be your sweet spot, I would just point out. But, but usually these hard problems tend to have some phase transitions where, I mean, essentially it's easy, easy, easy. Then you have uh, some sort of uh, 
uh, abrupt phase transition and, and you get to a hard problem no, and there is no, no, no no in this case not so there is so basically the, the so you do this junction tree construction and it basically uh sets the largest clique then the, the complexity becomes uh, um exponentially in k where k is a number between one and n right and so you get uh you can so depending on the type of topology of the graph k can be small or can be actually in, in the worst case can be equal to n so you can have any kind of intermediate complexity. So that should fit your purpose, I would assume. Right? No. Well, well, in theory, yes. Uh, if you can also uh, distill uh, the structure in these intermediate cases uh, and, uh, and, and use the structure in an algorithmic, algorithmically meaningful way. Because if you know that uh, um, kind of this sort of hardness exists, but you cannot uh, codify it in, a, in an algorithm and, and, and you cannot exploit it, well then, uh, uh, well then again, there is, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a useful kind of structure if you, know, if you don't know what sort of structure is. But um, yeah, my knowledge of this, uh, of, uh, of, of, this uh, of the models you're describing is limited and I'd, I'd be happy to know more about them and, uh, and perhaps we can chat later about this. Yeah, so do you, can you give any hints so if exponential NP is, is not useful, but polynomial is also not useful, I guess. Well, so I can give it? you a learning example is, um, so the learnability of uh, disjunctive normal forms, uh, that is, uh, so these are um, Boolean functions that are composed by uh, conjunctions uh, of disjunctions, and every literal can appear as itself or as negation. So uh, these kind of problems, uh, have uh, um, have um, a, a concentrated Fourier spectrum. So what do I mean by that is if you take the Fourier transform of uh, of these functions, uh, you will find that uh, most uh, of of the mass uh, falls uh, on a subset that is logarithmically small with respect uh, to the Boolean cube. So now this is a kind of problem that uh, um, uh, requires um, classically um, uh, super polynomial resources to find this uh, heavy free coefficients that then can be used to, to learn the function. And uh, well, with a quantum computer, what you can do is just uh, use uh, a quantum free sampling and, and get these coefficients uh, uh, right away. So this is a kind of problem that has uh, the right structure uh, that is uh, well suited for a quantum computer. That is, uh, well, Hard for hard, hard classically, but not not too hard uh, for for a quantum computer. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question. So there's one from Vedran. Can you go ahead and ask the question? Yeah, sure. So thank you very much for the talk. Uh, um, I, I think it's a really really nice observation which you guys done, um, and I've been aware of it for a while. But I, I have maybe you can help me a little bit with with agreeing with your interpretation. Of your result right because if you just go two slides back or if one goes two slides back you have this very large statement saying maybe one more supervised quantum machine learning allows the camera chip polynomial uh, pull over everything run times in n right so i mean this is manifestly not true they can but then they fail to satisfy certain theoretical guarantees and more specifically which which you've shown and, and please correct me if i'm wrong here is that uh the bound under excess risk, so the difference between the empirical and the total risk, cannot scale better than the algorithmic error. Is this not sort of a short, short core of your result? Um, well, or is there more? Well, it should not, rather than cannot. No, it rather, is... rather, rather. Let's put it this way: Can I not write down a variant of the same theorem of the of the of the statistical learning theorem, where on the right hand side? Where, where I showed that the difference between excess and the, and the total risk is the max of the standard thing and the algorithmic error, right? Where the algorithmic error is a function of something. I'm not telling you what it is, something. But in our case, it's going to be the gamma, right? In the gamma of the quantum algorithm. So unless I'm getting it really wrong, I mean, what this is saying is that you cannot achieve as quickly scaling theoretical guarantees on the, on the reduce in the difference between the uh, empirical and the, and, the, and the total risk in N, 
But in practice, for instance, if I have, let's say, any real world model, like a neural network or any model, doesn't matter. You know, the way I would interpret to use this theorem is I run it on my data set and I look at my empirical risk and I know that beyond the data set, it will probably behave not much, much more worse than what gives, what's given by the right hand side of the inequality, right? But I mean, in practice also, and not just in practice, this is a fact of life, you don't get to 99.979s empirical risk. You get to 95 if you're really lucky, right? But if I'm happy with 95 empirical risk, if I'm not killing myself at that point, then maybe I'm happy with 94. And I just need a constant difference between total risk and empirical risk. And this I can certainly do with a constant error, can I not? So let me see if I understand correctly what you're saying. You're saying that if you basically say, uh, I keep constant the error, so I'm fine with the- uh, well, I keep it as a separate, I keep it as a separate parameter independent from n. So I agree that if you, if you say, okay, it's, if it's independent of n, well then it's fine. And, and this result, this sort of analysis uh, is no longer relevant. But well, I would I argue it's that- critical. No, no, I think it's actually critical, I'm sorry. I think your analysis is extremely critical because it allows me to separate the two things, right? It allows me to say, well, you know, and you said it explicitly in maybe the one of the early slides saying that as long as I want to achieve the scaling as one over root n, which is the best, well, it's actually tight, right? In, in, terms, of, yeah. uh, in terms of theory. Well, and then it better be the case that the, my error is not dominated by something which is larger, right? And you say, well, I, I mean, have algorithmic yeah, error in there. But then, then I'm saying, okay, but let's spin the story around. I mean, suppose the theory was harsh and it wasn't one over root n, but one over log n. I could still have machine learning, right? It would just have less useful bounds, less precise bounds on, on the excess risk. But I, I would not go from saying that to supervised machine learning cannot be done in polar logarithmic time. You can, but you have to be aware that you know your empirical risk is only going to be sorry excess risk is only going to be as good as the extra effort you're willing to put in but, well, but no, would, it, would would you agree with the statement that if you want to be if you want to achieve the best statistical accuracy possible with the data you have then the statement that i've well, written no, down no, because it's, is yeah, wait wait but it's an asymptotic no no because it's an asymptotic statement right i don't have a fixed data set the entire theory only applies when i have an increasing size right so I would, uh, I would disagree. Well, for I large n, uh, yes, but uh, but but it's a constant number, right? You put on, put n to be ten billion or a hundred billion or whatever, right? And and I get some empirical risk, and as long I, as I agree that is as an asymptote. But then, okay, if I then restate what I've just said in an asymptotic sense, so would you agree with that? No, no, there there is there is certainly an interpretation of what you're saying is absolutely true, right? I'm just trying to, I'm trying to reconcile it with what happens in the real world and what I should really care about as somebody who wants to apply uh, machine learning. And I'm, I'm trying to reconcile it with, well, for instance, the fact that I cannot really expect that my empirical risk is going to converge to, to zero because my model family is not going to be infinitely expressive. In the moment my data set is complex enough, there's going to be bound on how well I'm going to do. And if my empirical risk is not converging to one, then there's always a gap, right? So I, I am somehow committed beforehand to live with the fact that I will never get perfect performance. But then how imperfect are you happy with? And I'm saying as long as this thing is not necessarily scaling as one over root 10, but let's say one over log n, then we're fine. And I would argue further that in fact, in practice, you're, you're happy with constants, I think. So I'm, okay. I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm trying to understand. Not entirely un uh, understand this point, but perhaps we should discuss uh... Uh, I mean, uh, you, run, you, run your, you run your machine learning algorithm and you see that you have 99.4% accuracy on your training set. Yeah. Are you happy or mm -hmm. are you not happy? But there, there's a decision to be made. I'm happy, yeah, sure. You're happy, okay. Would you, be, would you have been happy with 99.3? Well, I guess so, yes. <laughs> right, so, so, so I take this 0 0.01 and this is my constant that I'm happy to live with, obviously, and I can simply put it in the excess risk, in the difference. And now I only okay. need to get the, 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 the algorithmic error to be that small. But then, okay, that what you're saying is exactly the fact that if you keep the error constant at a level that is less than what is uh, theoretically achievable. With the function family sort of, in the data set, yes. yes. Yeah, then these sort of arguments uh, uh, are no longer true. And, and I agree with, or at least uh, cannot be true. And well, I agree it, with this it statement. Has, it, has so. to be, it has to be qualified, right? 
because there's another point if you say that it will converge to better than that, then you made a statement about the VC dimension of your model. Because if that is high, if that is sort of so high that it's ridiculous that you're guaranteed to always converge to the optimum, then the right-hand side actually doesn't really, for non-asymptotic statements, doesn't care about N, but the fact that your VC dimension is too high, right? Where you get into the neural network problems, et cetera, where the theory kind of stops matching the, the, what we see in real life. So, yes, uh, uh, so just, just to, okay, just to summarize, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't misunderstand the actual statement. Okay, so, so. I think I, you did understand it correctly. Okay, thank you very much. Then, then <laughs> otherwise I'm perfectly happy except the particular wording on the slide here, because I think it's a little bit too harsh uh, for quantum machine learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks. So there was one more question from uh, Florian, if you want to uh, ask it uh, quickly. I think we have to wrap up soon, but uh, a quick question okay. would be... Uh, uh, thank you. So, so I'm more naive on this, uh, but I, I was asking myself about overfitting. Where does this come in, into this picture? Because we know that uh, if you really literally find the model that minimizes the empirical risk, it's often very bad, actually, on the whole. Uh, on the whole distribution of possible samples. Uh, and in the bound that you had in the beginning, is that hidden somehow in the C of H complexity thing? Is that where, so to speak, the possibility of overfitting is hiding? Yeah, this is absolutely correct. Okay. And, uh, and it's also one of the reasons why this sort of uh, uh, models uh, don't capture well uh, neural networks. Because uh, with, with neural networks, you have that the um, the, this measure of complexity is usually very, very big. And so this would, uh, would, would tell you that the sort of errors you're making is very big, but in practice, uh, they do much, much better than, than the bound. And that's okay. why uh, they don't work for, for neural networks. However, okay. for support vector machines, the bound are very tight. Uh, very good. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you. And uh, let's thank uh, Andrea for the nice talk.